Hello and welcome to Paleo Logos. My name is Peter, and tonight I have the privilege of welcoming Dr. Bergman uh, to the stream. Uh, thank you all who are tuning in this evening. We're going to be having a discussion about the Australopithecines. Uh, so, Dr. Bergman, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I was a college professor for 40 some years, taught primarily in the science area, and uh, taught uh, biology, anatomy, physiology. Uh, many of my students were in the medical field, so I oriented my teaching toward that area. And I've always enjoyed teaching. I started out as an elementary teacher, then taught high school, and then went on and taught uh, college, university level for most of my career. Wonderful. Uh, thanks so much for uh, coming on this evening. Uh, great to have you here. Uh, we've got some people in the live chat. Hello there. Thanks for tuning in this evening. Yeah, so tonight uh, we're going to talk about the Australopithecines, and uh, Dr. Bergman has a presentation which he'll be sharing with us. Before we get into uh, that presentation, uh, could you kind of uh, bring us into a little bit about why exactly this issue of human evolution is important to you and why you feel that this is uh, something that you want to kind of communicate about? Well, evolution is, of course, a concern of mine since I taught biology for many years. And, but I don't find many people are all that upset or concerned about trilobite evolution or mollusk evolution or the evolution of flies and so on. The main concern really is the evolution of humans. That's what we're concerned about. And so, therefore, I focus on other areas, but I always come back to the idea of humans evol evolving. And I've done a lot of reading about that, and especially since I taught uh, psychology courses as well. I, of course, cover Neanderthals and other individuals. Taught uh, anthropology, I should mention as well. And of course, there's chapters on the different ape men that we we look at today. And so, therefore, uh, it's a interesting concern. And, and, and again, I have done a, a book on fossil forensics, which covers general areas like plants and, and, and and mammals and so on, but my more greater interest, of course, is a fossil evidence for humans. Did we did we evolve? Sure, yeah. So Dr. Bergman has a book which he's a co-author on, Apes as Ancestors, uh, which uh, we'll be discussing perhaps a little bit this evening. Uh, so you should check that out if you're interested in learning more about uh, Dr. Bergman's views on the Australopithecines and also uh, human evolution in general. So generally, kind of uh, from a biblical standpoint, do you think that human evolution is is compatible with the Bible? And if not, can you kind of provide us with your reasoning for why exactly you don't think it is? Well, the basis of Christianity is Adam and Eve were created by God. And Adam sinned, Eve sinned, and as a result, sin entered in, into the world. And as a result, Christ's sacrifice was to atone for that sin. You take out Adam and Eve, then inherited sin concept is gone, and Christ's sacrifice is gone as well. So a critical part of the I get a cough drop here, I start talking and I but anyways, a critical part of the Christian message is cre cre creation of man and uh, the, the Genesis fall and as a result the atonement of Christ. So therefore Christianity. Genesis to Revelation, basically the theme is the fall of man and the regeneration through the sacrifice of Christ, accepting that, of course, will allow us to be forgiven for the sins that we inherit. It's hard to be perfect when your parents are not perfect. And so once sin enters into the world, then we all inherit that. And as a result, we are all imperfect and therefore we all sin, even the best of us, of course, sin. And so that is a, it's why human evolution is so important. We have we need to establish Adam and Eve were real people that lived and really sin entered by their behavior. Yeah, I think it's certainly very problematic to try to interpret, you know, the only death that happened through the fall is spiritual death. And really, that's very hard to fit into the Bible when we have instances, for example, after the flood, God gives uh, Noah and his family uh, warrant to eat meat. Well, why did God give them the warrant to eat meat if, you know, death and they'd been preying on animals uh all before up to that point right what significance does that even have if if that is all you know somehow metaphorical or if you know death had already been going on or if humans had already been you know eating animals or 
you know, there's biblical passages really have a hard time lining up with a view like that, I think. When I was working on my second doctorate, I did a study, had a population course. I did a study of, of human population. And it, to get the data that we have from what we know about population increases goes back pretty much to Adam. And so if you go back thousands or more years, you end up with a much larger population and the data we have just doesn't show that. So a lot of data basically on the population of Rome and Greece and other societies that existed back then. And you had fairly small numbers. Rome, I think at the largest was not much more than 2 million people. And so therefore you, you go back to Adam and it fits nicely. And I did this for a secular class, working with a professor who was a population expert. That's what he taught and that's what he did. And uh, he said, yeah, it does. It goes back to two people back to Adam and Eve, although he didn't accept that creation worldview. He was an evolutionist. But on the other hand, he said, well, you're, we don't know how we figure this out. But on the other hand, you've done this data. And therefore, you go back to two people about 6,000 years ago. He felt there must have been a bottleneck. So we had huge numbers of population before that. And basically, mm -hmm. a catastrophic event caused elimination of most of the human population. And therefore, we get the data we got because that bottleneck. So that's how he explained it. But I just went back to as far as we could go and looked at that. Yeah. And he was nice to work with. And he understood where I was coming from and uh, realized that, yeah, you've got a good point here. So tonight, we wanted to kind of talk about the Australopithecine specifically because they're a very important kind of subject for this whole topic of human evolution, right? Because they are believed to be basically the immediate ancestors of the genus Homo. And, uh, you know, possibly Paranthropus is, uh, you know, a sister clade to Homo. But these Australopithecus type creatures uh, factor very large in kind of an evolutionary explanation of exactly how humans arose. So uh, you can uh, open your presentation if you'd like to get into that now. Okay. Um, but that's kind of our goal tonight for everyone listening. Uh, Someone says, looking forward to learning. Thank you for having Dr. Bergman on tonight. Well, it's uh, my pleasure to have him. All right. I will uh, share your presentation on the screen. There we go. Yeah. There it is. You can uh, just click out of that uh, screen share and you can click hide there and uh, we should be all set. Okay. Well, all I see is the PowerPoint, which is... Okay. As long as what you see is okay, then we're doing well. Uh, yeah, we can go ahead. Yep. Okay, Genesis 127, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female, he created he them. It's from the King James Bible. And that pretty much, pretty clear that indeed Genesis requires creation of Adam and Eve, male and female. And to deal with that, I did this book called Apes as Ancestors. I edited it and actually I had several other authors. Peter uh, was in Tom, uh, Dr. Tompkins and Daniel vital was uh, we were together on this but uh, so it took a long time and uh, we did our research in the christian world today this is being debated here's a christianity today article and the search for the historical adam and basically they talked about there are many theologians who believe that there was no historical physical adam but basically it's a symbol for the first man or it's a spiritual first adam etc and so they talked about this debate and so I went to Baylor University when we were talking about this, and I thought their evidence is pretty, pretty shallow. And uh, that's one thing that motivated me to look indeed as, at the evidence for human evolution. And when you look at differences between church teachings, we find that some churches basically accept evolution as a fact, and 81% of Buddhists, 80% of Hindus, 77% of Jews, unaffiliated, 72%, 58% of Catholics. We go down to mainline Protestant, about half accept evolution as the explanation for the origin of man. And <laughs> a Muslim, uh, less than half. Historical Black Protestant, only 38%. Evangelical Protestant, 24%. Mormon, 22%. And Jehovah's Witnesses, only 8%. So 92% of Jehovah's Witnesses accept that the creation account, Genesis, is the best explanation for the origin of man. And looking at some of these drawings done by artists, it's interesting that a lot of these are based on, and this is just one of many examples, a lot of these are based on what are actually living 
animals or people today. And the first one you can see very much looks like an ape. Second one is still very apish, but very human. And the third, <laughs> even more human. The fourth looks like an African-American. The fifth, pretty much like someone walking down the main street. And the sixth is supposed to be a uh, Caucasian. And so this <laughs> is an illustration of some of the racism that we see in the, uh, in the drawings. And in the, so do you think that... Uh, you know, modern evolutionary thought is is racist in nature because, uh, you know, I think there was certainly, you know, obviously a prominent evolutionary uh, persons in, in the past, including Charles Darwin, were obviously very racist. But do you think that modern evolutionary ideas surrounding the origin of man are necessarily racist? Well, today, of course, that idea is not accepted among most scientists, but it certainly was accepted for decades. I sure. collect old textbooks. I have hundreds of old biology books, and it's blatant, the racism in many of these books was obvious and blatant yeah. in the text as well as in the words. Certainly. Yeah. That, that is the history which many uh, biologists now are coming to accept and try to deal with, but nonetheless, they say, yeah, it was true in the past, but it's not true in, uh, today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, okay, these are mannequins that are drawn from the bones of Lucy. And we can see, number one, from these pictures, how different they are. They are. One here looks pretty much like a guy you would you would meet at a football game. And the second one looks like Lucy, a female. Some look like males. Some look like females. So talking here. about that, um, one thing which I kind of noticed in your text was kind of a discussion of the, the sclera, the eye coloring of the Australopithecines. And you pointed out that a lot of times Australopithecines are reconstructed with having a white uh, sclera similar to humans. And uh, you were arguing kind of that that is uh, some of an evolutionary bias. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about that? Well, yeah, we have no evidence on the eye color of uh, just about anybody going back in history, except if we have paintings or testimony in the writings. But by and large, Lucy, they have no idea what eye color they would, would she or he would be. And uh, they use the white color of the eyes, the white of the eyes, to make them look more human. And so this is added, and I'll show you a few pictures later on, which illustrates that. But now we do know a little bit, like that, some modern apes, like gorillas, do have like a variable eye color, right? Because gorillas can range from having a very dark sclera all the way to having a light one, almost like uh, modern humans. So do you think that it is, is necessary to interpret Lucy as having a dark sclera, or is it possible that she could have had, a, you know, a, a range of, of colors? Yeah, it's possible, but not very many primates sure. have, the, have the, quote, the whites of the eye. Mm -hmm. There's a few exceptions, but there are very few. If you look sure. in any book on primates, the vast majority, in fact, I looked at a number of books that I have on primates, and the vast majority that, well, in the books that I use, everyone, did not have the whites of the eyes. And so uh, this is an assumption they make. Now these, you can kind of see whites of the eyes. And these are supposed to be Lucy. And this is an, another, two, uh, another picture of Lucy. And again, what I noticed on this was very primate monkey face and very human body. In fact, I have friends, if they had a body like this, would be pretty broad. I mean, they've got a good build. And of course, they have a human body. And you notice this in so many of the pictures, a human body and an ape face. And this is why we don't have much evidence of what the body was like. We do with Lucy, you have some, but the vast majority of fossil men that we have, all we have is fragments, mostly of the skull, and at best, a few other parts of the body. So therefore, they tend to draw the bodies like modern men and the heads like uh, apes. And this to show you the contrast, profiles of the two apes and humans they claim for years were 99% the same, or some would say 98%, some 97%. Now, when you actually make these comparisons, the best data I'm aware of, it's about 85% similar. So we're talking about 15% difference, which is almost a half a billion DNA basis difference. And therefore, you would expect that given the different in appearance. And there you can see by looking at the faces, the difference is striking between the two. This is a recent article from National Geographic. That's where I got it from. And the reason I used this picture was because I'm surprised that they used the 99%, which hasn't been used for many years. And we've known 
studies, they, they vary, of course, depends on how you do the analysis, but we've known that the difference is far greater than that for, for a decade. And this you can see by creationists. This is the chart of where creationists are at. We can see the range of opinions among creationists about where these are at, ER 1813, for example. We can see that Gish, Grape, and Line, which is who I work with, says they're human. And this shows you the difference in conclusions. And this is partially because all we have in most cases is bone fragments. And therefore, we don't have a we don't have in most cases a complete skeleton. And ideally, at least we have a complete skull, and we don't have that in many cases. Now, some people would argue, I've I've heard it argued by evolutionists that our kind of struggles to tell apart, tell the difference between, you know, what uh, which of these fossils are human and which are non-human is based primarily because there's such a perfect transition between these Australopithecines and these early humans. But you don't think that's the case. No, you no, think I that it is more of the fragmentary nature and that if we had a more complete specimen, we would be able to distinguish more clearly. Right. That's my conclusion. Okay. And as we find more specimens, we're better able to distinguish the two. And of course, the fact is, is we have people walking around today that have very ape-like features. And so, you know, there are skeletons out there which indeed show those traits, and that doesn't necessarily directly prove that indeed we evolved from apes. There are other evidence that we use. But of course, the main one is, of course, the, uh, the skeletons, and especially the skulls. Lucy, one of the most famous. There are probably hundreds of mannequins of Lucy in museums throughout the world. And this is commonly touted as the beginnings of mankind. And this is a, a one important one because we have more bones of Lucy than virtually any other uh, supposed primitive uh, human. The actual bones you can see here. And we have some very few complete bones. We have fragments of many bones. So when you weigh the difference between modern man and Lucy, we see that we have about 20% of the skeleton. Now I say it's about 40%, but what they're looking at is if we have part of a bone, they're just counting that as the entire bone. And therefore, actually, when we look at the parts, we're talking about 20%. And mm -hmm. you can just weigh the difference and estimate the difference, and that's what number you get. And problems is, number one, they found, and I should mention that, there's controversy in some of these areas because we didn't have a film crew there filming everything they did and when they did it. And there's controversy about when they discovered whatever. But on the other hand, they tried to record, of course, what was discovered and where. But from what we know, they found several hundred hominite bone fragments at the Lucy site. And this was scattered over about an hour and a half square miles or about 2.4 uh, square kilometers. So don't we have, though, um, uh, a communication from Donald Johansson saying that uh, Lucy's bones were discovered in, in three square meters? Or am I well, mistaken on that? Because I, I think that was even mentioned in, in Apes' as ancestors. Um, yeah, he makes that claim. But on the okay. other hand, there are some people who disagree with in fact, so how ex how exactly do you, do you kind of know where exactly you got that one and a half square mile estimate from? Well, from the literature, that's where I got it from. Okay. From, but of course, that doesn't mean it's right. And again, when you look at the literature, you need to do an extensive survey. And on this, on Lucy, we looked at much of the literature, but I haven't spent my last ten years focusing on Lucy. So sure. And if yeah. it's you know, when I present this material, someone says no, this is wrong, and then I can modify. it. Sure. Yeah. What, what I'm aware of, though, is found in a fairly wide area. Yeah. So I understand that they they um, they sieved an, an area of gravel, but around the the original site, which I understand from communication with Donald Johansson was three square meters. But around uh, around that location, they sieved quite a bit of gravel. But uh, I, I I'm struggling to uh, to understand where exactly. Uh, oh, that one and a half square mile estimate would have come from. Okay, maybe I'll check. And you could well be right. And I have, uh, I'm aware of that claim. And then I'm aware of others who say no. What sure. I'm aware okay. of is that the vast majority of the bones were found in this three square meter area. But okay. they found other bones away from there. 
and they assume that these belong to Lucy. So uh, may, maybe a technical difference we're looking at, not really the the major difference, but all right. But anyways, so, yeah. But any information on that, and uh, I find when I go out and present this material, every now and then someone says, "Hey, if you're wrong about this," and then I can correct it. Certainly, don't claim infallibility in what I say, and so feedback when you go out and lecture on this stuff is really helpful, really important because it, I, I tune my, retune my uh, presentations. But on the other hand, it has come the other way as well, where I've made statements and they said, no, that's not quite right. Actually, it's, it's more problematic than you claim. And so it's gone both ways. Anyways, out of 47, and this I'm pretty certain about, 47 of the 207 bones found, most were small fragments or fairly small fragments. And they reconstruct the skeleton according to a belief about the fossil. In other words, they had a perception of what the fossil would look like, a ape man. And as a result, it was reconstructed according to that data. And of course, they have to have some conclusion. I mean, they have to have some pre-existing belief. If they believe clearly that Lucy was fully human, the skull, etc., would probably be constructed quite differently. Or if they believe she or he was clearly ape, again, it would probably be put together quite differently. So can you kind of tell us about some of the details? You say there the, the mandible resembles that of the gorilla. Can you kind of give us some of the details about how exactly the mandible is similar to a gorilla rather than well, they, When you compare example? the mandible with the gorilla, as you find out it resembles, not that it's exactly like it. But, sure. but again, the mandible, I think I have a picture over here somewhere. But there you can see the mandible. And... Uh, that that's what those who have studied it concluded it resembles that of a gorilla and so okay. therefore and here you can see the bones in a ape present quite well they fit in quite well and they also fit quite well into a human and so they, that's what they're trying to show with this that indeed given the bones you can construct somewhat reasonably an ape as well as a human so, so speaking to... about limb proportions, this is kind of interesting. This is where kind of the recent discovery of Littlefoot comes in, right? Because Littlefoot mm -hmm. is the most complete Australopithecus skeleton ever found where we have like the complete limb bones that, you know, we don't really have to, you know, care so much about gaps in them. And uh, from Littlefoot, you know, what we know is that they had a longer leg than their arms. So do you think there's reasoning then to extrapolate that similar creatures that another species of Australopithecus would also kind of follow that same trajectory as having similar limb proportions? Oh, yeah, sure. And this is kind of misleading when you look at these pictures because, again, Lucy was about, what, uh, three? Three and a half feet tall. Half feet tall. And so, therefore, the man they show here looks like he's six feet tall and not three feet tall. So you're right uh, that, indeed, if these were better proportioned, you would get details that look different. And so, yeah, that's a good point. And uh, I think Lucy now would be the second most complete skeleton they found. Right, so yeah. Littlefoot okay. is very interesting because of how much we have preserved there. And then we also have the articulation, right? The partial articulation, at least, of like the hand bones with the arm, but all of the parts within a, a rock in situ altogether, right? And so that's, that's pretty important, given that Lucy was a surface find, right? And so, but now with Littlefoot, we have a much more complete skeleton and we have it in situ and partially articulated, which really is is problematic for those who want to say, you know, that the Australopithecines are completely chimeric, right? That they're a mixture completely of human and ape bones. No, we do recognize that there is some type of genera of Australopithecus because of, of finds like Littlefoot. Okay, yeah, that's a good point. And there's so many finds. I mean, we selected the ones to cover in my book, the ones that are most prominent, which means they got the most publicity, not necessarily the best finds or not necessarily all the finds that, were, that are out there. The concern we had, though, was the number of pages. And the publisher said, you know, this is a mammoth book. And so we had about, I don't know, 800 pages. And that's why they had it instead of the normal book size. They had it eight and a half by 11, the larger size. So they had fewer pages and that would lower the cost. So those things. <laughs> so we have one question coming in here. Um, uh, Bread of Life says, I'm confused. I thought we had a lot of complete Australopithecines. How many complete ones do we have? Isn't one enough to know what the body looked like? 
Well, the conclusions they come to from the Australopithecines are from many, many different finds. And so the, up to recently, the most complete find was Lucy. And Lucy is the most well known. And so, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, we have a lot so of information. We have a number of different skeletons. So we have Littlefoot, we have Lucy, we also have a skeleton called Catanumu, although there's some debate about exactly which species that belongs to. We also have, also have a juvenile called Salam. Uh, we have several different ske postcranial skeletons from a, a site called Sturkfontein in South Africa. Uh, so we have a variety of different skeletons from the Australopithecines. Now we don't have any complete ones, if you're saying complete by having every single bone in the body, but we have uh, a sampling of a lot of different parts from different individuals and also uh, individuals that do contain uh, the parts together as well. Yeah, that's true. Like with Neanderthals, we have a complete skeleton based on many, many skeletons in, found in various parts of the world. And they've been right. able to put that together and get a good idea of very, very close to what indeed Neanderthals look like based on the many skeletons that they were able to assemble. So, yeah. yeah and and it, that's a good point there because we haven't even found a complete skeleton of Neanderthals. And Neanderthal skeletons generally do tend to be more complete than a lot of these Australopithecus skeletons that we find uh, better preserved, right? But we still haven't even found a, a complete Neanderthal skeleton. But once we have a large sample size from lots of different individuals, it's, it's not so necessary to have uh, complete skeletons as long as we can reliably, you know, say which species the bones belong to. Yeah, that's true. Now, Littlefoot, I can't remember the percent of the skeleton they found for the Littlefoot was what? It's at least 90%, I'm pretty sure. 90%? Uh, it, it's around there, I think. I, I'd have to look it up, but we're missing some of the hand bones from the right hand, and we're missing a lot of the toe bones. But other than that, it's pretty complete. Okay. So it's quite a gap between the completeness of Littlefoot and uh, Lucy. Correct. Yeah, Littlefoot is way more complete than Lucy is. Yeah, and and not just that the not that just we have more bones. It's also that the bones that we have from Littlefoot are uh, better preserved than those from Lucy as well. That we have we have more of the parts of the bone and not just fragments of it. Yeah, that's true. Okay, Leotoli footprints. Uh, I cover this briefly. Uh, they found some ancient hominin. Footprints in Laetoli, which of course is in Tanzania. And the feeling was they belong to Lucy, uh, or at least Lucy's type, I should say, Australopithecus afarensis. And they're dated by evolutionists to be, and of course these datings vary because you can't date footprints. You have to date the material around it. And you have to use other methods to try to figure out when the footprints were made. But some estimates say these footprints are close to half a million years older than Lucy. So there's obviously some debate in, in the secular community about this, right? Because you have uh, Russell Tuttle, who is doing the very early work on the Laetoli footprints. And then you have uh, some other scientists who have done some more recent excavations and kind of analyses as well. So uh, more recent analyses have uh, shown there to be, you know, a statistical a statistically significant difference between the Laetoli footprints and and human footprints. So, do you think that uh, there that those studies are actually picking up on real morphological differences there, or do you think that uh, the Laetoli footprint should be attributed to uh, humans? Well, from what we know about them, and I have comparisons here, you can see a human foot and a uh, primate. Feet. Actually, primate don't have two hands and two feet. They have four hands. And that's useful because they climb trees. And they can climb trees really well because they have four grasping hands to allow them to climb trees. But of course, humans don't have that. So the foot is quite different. So when we look at and you can see the difference there. And that is one of the best examples of the footprint, which looks more like a human than a non-human or so one thing which I've, I've seen picked up on by some authors is for example that gap there between uh the first toe and the second or you know really the big toe and, and your second toe and you know some papers have you know argued that the australopithecines did have uh a, a toe that was in line with the other toe uh, sorry a big toe that was in line with the other toes what do you kind of think of those arguments 
Well, that's a possibility, of course, but I think more from, uh, we don't have a lot of, of course, with Lucy, we don't have, we have a few fragments of the feet and the hands, but mm-hmm. very few. We don't have enough really to make much determination. Not from Lucy, therefore, yeah. But that's true. It doesn't look, doesn't look like a normal human footprint. But then I, on the other hand, people who do studies of these find that we don't necessarily leave a print that looks exactly like the foot because in walking, we pull our foot forward, allowing the toes to dig in to some degree the sand. And therefore, uh, according to studies, according to people who study these, say basically, if you saw someone walking down a beach today, the footprints would be very, very similar. So have you kind of looked at the papers, you know, arguing that the the Laetoli footprints are that we can find distinguish them from modern humans and kind of what do you think about their you know analyses do you think they're looking at too small of a scale if they're able to distinguish between these footprints and those of modern humans or uh, do you tend to agree with Tuttle then well I think it's it, it, I think Tuttle has made some good points uh, okay. I think it's it's intriguing that we don't have a hundred percent evidence a human footprint nor do we have any certainly clear evidence of a Australopithecine footprint because, of course, of the digit placement. But on the other hand, uh, it's intriguing. And, of course, we have a lot of footprints, so we have some idea. Yeah. And what was interesting to me, right, is that we also have bones of Lucy's species, Australopithecus afarensis, at this same site, Laetoli, preserved in the, I believe, either in the same beds or possibly slightly beneath the, the Laetoli footprints as well in this same locale. Yeah, that's true. That's how they, uh, that's how they determine what Lucy's uh, bone structure, the feet and hands would be because of other, of course, Australopithecines. So, but Lucy itself, we don't have the connection. Here's an artist's conception of, uh, and I, again, I intrigued that uh, look like uh, modern bodies and ape heads walking in these in footprints. So this, this assumes a very human-like body. And what is intriguing is, of course, they found fossils of many modern mammals like giraffes and so on. And so, uh, and they show a giraffe here in this picture. A very mm-hmm. famous picture of Lucy. 69 prints, 31 large, 38 smaller ones, and um, preserved in volcanic ash. And uh, these were found about a thousand miles from the Lucy bones. Of course, they're not claiming that they were Lucy's, but they were right. the similar organism. And uh, some conclude they were likely human footprints. And I quote some like Tim White said, Laetoli human trails do not differ substantially from modern human trails made on a similar substrate. And then another example is, uh, so we conclude the same thing. And here they mention we move forward by using the big toes and chimpanzees walk bipedally with the curled lateral toes. And so the that the toes are distorted in humans because the toes are used to push one forward. And mm-hmm. so therefore they may not, not show a clear, a clear human footprint that you would make if you were trying to get a human footprint. But yeah. They, in a case like this, where we have evidence from footprints, it's very hard to really come to a substantial conclusion. And, you know, I, I think it's, we have to be very careful, not only not, you know, saying, you know, wh- whether it is human or not, but then also whether you're going to say it's an Australopithecine or not, you know, going down to the level of a certain Australopithecus species is pretty tentative as well. So I think, you know, it's best to remain, you know, very open to something like this, you know, open to possibilities, because when we have evidence like this, that just isn't very, you know, substantive, it's, it's can be difficult to interpret. And when we have creatures whose feet look pretty similar, it, it can be hard to distinguish between them. Yeah, well, that's a good point. Yeah, there's no question that we should be tentative in that way. If we're, we're shown to be wrong, we can say, well, I was just tentative. <laughs> yep. If we really push an idea and insist we're right, and then we're shown to be wrong, we look somewhat foolish. That's a good point. So anyways, they found additional footprints later, about 2016. And uh, what I find intriguing is we found many footprint hundreds belonging to modern mammals and birds. So that uh, is indicative. Some claim that these were prints of local people. I'm kind of skeptical about that, but there are people, the Messiah. They say children often walk in the adult footprints, which is what we found in these. And they claim that uh, they claim that indeed these footprints were done by the tribe in that area. 
Now, and have you, you see. seen the uh, have you seen the paper that came out in 2021 about uh, those new footprints? Let's see, was it from uh, Site G at Laetoli? Okay, uh, no, I haven't. Okay, so there was a new paper that came out. So originally, when they were first working on the Laetoli footprints, before they'd found like the famous Site S trail, I believe it is, mm -hmm. they they had found a trail called Site G, but they weren't certain whether it was uh, created by a bipedal animal or not, and they thought it might have been a bear. Um, but in okay, uh, bear, yeah, I'm aware of that. Go ahead. Okay, but then they returned to it and they did uh, a statistical analysis on it and found that the organism that made those prints was cross-stepping, and they concluded that you know bears when they're walking on their hind legs, cannot cross step like that. But interestingly, those footprints were very different, not only from human footprints, but also from Australopithecines, you know, based on our understanding of the Australopithecus foot morphology. So what do you think about that? Do you think this is evidence for an unknown hominin species walking at Laetoli? I think it's intriguing because it's evidence for, well, maybe we can't say it was Lucy, we can't say it's a modern human. And uh, what it is, and of course, so many of the footprints are poorly preserved and they are not very clear. The one I showed is alleged to be the best footprint there. And so, yeah, it's intriguing. But again, the local people say, given, you know, they're wanting to point out what's there is their people, but they say, indeed, this were done by our people. But this picture here shows a modern human and uh, Lucy, and you can see the difference in size is quite apparent, which... Uh, Unfortunately, many pictures don't don't show that well. Now, the dark brown is the actual bone fragments they found. And of course, the white would be what was filled in. And so you can see from what was found, it doesn't, it could be interpreted differently. And therefore, it's difficult to produce the host's skull, in this case, from the bones that were found. They have found, indeed, they found fragments. And uh, the fragments were found. Assuming these all belong to the same organism. Artist interpretation, there are many, many examples, and these are a few of how they interpret very differently the bones that were found, showing again how important the interpretation is in uh, drawing these pictures. And this is two models. This is at the Creation Museum. And Dr. Menton, who is an anatomist, he was important in this, in putting this together, but he concluded that the bones they found in Lucy were indeed, would be a pretty common ape. So generally, do you take the position that Lucy is in a single individual, or do you think it's it's multiple individuals? Well, this, the literature basically concludes it's a single individual, although mm -hmm. that's true. It could be multiple individuals. But what position do you take on that? I think it was pr probably a single individual from what is, okay. what sure. is known. But then again, it, gotta be careful taking strong positions because we found in reviewing the literature that so many leading paleontologists, their strong positions have been contradicted and had to eat cake. So, so can you tell us a little bit about your reasoning, why exactly you think it's a single individual? Well, I suppose because one, they fit together. If it was several individuals, you would find several bones that were, you find several femur bones, for example, mm -hmm. or several femur fragments that didn't fit together and that couldn't be from the same individual. So the bones they found from what I've read appear to be the same individual because they they don't overlap and there's no direct evidence that they're from a different individual. But of course they could be. One would assume if there are two individuals, they would find bones that overlap, but I'm not aware that there's- Or even from different sizes, right? So that was the thing when they had that one thoracic vertebrae from that uh, Theropithecus that they found in the Lucy skeleton. What happened was that it turned out to be very, very small compared to the rest of the skeletal elements, right? So when we're looking at multiple individuals, we also expect to see size variants that that don't fit the skeleton. And you know that that's something that we don't really observe in the rest of the skeleton as well. Okay, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point that, uh, and from looking at that, it seems the size differences are not great enough to assume they came from different sized uh, animals. Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay, most famous missing link and, uh, I question whether or not there are these missing links. We certainly have plenty of evidence of uh, monkeys and certainly much evidence of, <laughs> of humans. But in between there, it's at least controversial. When you look at these skulls, one of the most important parts of uh, 
making comparisons. These are x-rays which were colored blue to highlight the differences. And you can see there's a lot of clear major differences between the two. And then uh, when you look at drawings, you can see primates, homo sapiens, the drawings they make look somewhat like Australopithecus is in between primates and uh, another primate. So we and would you argue, argue that taxonomically the Australopithecines aren't primates or? Oh, no, no. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I should say a prim, yeah, the word primate isn't very useful. I took this from another website, but uh, what would you, a given or, I'm not sure what this is supposed to be, but okay. we're trying to represent a typical primate, sure. non-Australopithecus right. primate, but a typical sure. right. primate that's around today. So yeah, that's good. That's a, a good point. Thank you. Walking upright is important because we can see major areas in the skeleton, which indicate they walked upright or they didn't walk upright. And that's what they're trying to show here. It's critical and at least many feel it's critical in to prove human evolution is because uh, most evolutionists or many at least believe that walking upright is a critical change from the, the monkey primate stance and the human stance. So do you, what position do you take on this? Do you say the Australopithecines are quadrupedal or bipedal? Where do you kind of go with that? Well, I, I feel that the evidence slightly favors the idea that they were not bipedal. Okay. Can you kind of talk about exactly how you deal with the various, you know, arguments that might be placed forward to say they are bipedal? So like based on Lucy's pelvis, for example. Okay, well, um, I'll show a few pictures here. Okay, you can see yeah. that one major difference is, of course, the position of the spinal cord and how it goes into the, the occipital, below the occipital area of the skull. And this you can see these pictures are pretty clear. Better are the form and magnum slots in the orangutan, male gorilla, female gorilla, and chimp and human. So we can see there's quite a dramatic difference here. And mm -hmm. uh, this is in anatomy books, which they use to teach the difference. And you can see that the occipital part of the human, there's no evidence of the foramen magnum. And then we can see turning them on the side so that you can see the bottom. You can see, again, a difference, quite a difference. Not so to say that there's nothing a, in between the human on the far right and the skeleton next to him, which would be the chimp. On the other hand, the average differences are pretty clear from what they claim. So do you think that the, uh, basically that the, uh, the frame and magnum is a good indicator of whether or not a creature is walking bipedally? It's certainly one common indicator used, although there are several. You mm -hmm. add them all up and I guess you can come to a a reasonable so, conclusion. But. So we know that the Australopithecines had a foramen magnum that was positioned uh, more closely to that of the modern human, but then they have the angling of that is more similar to perhaps going down into the range of chimpanzees. What do you kind of make of that? That they have that position like us, but then the angling like the chimpanzees. Does that imply kind of use in a variety of ways or why exactly if they're walking around just like chimpanzees, do they have a frame and magnum in a similar place to us? Well, that's a good question. And they, from what I've looked at, the research indicates that there was certainly animals out there that had traits in between the two. And this is one trait which may indeed be, be would support the evolution of humans from a more primitive primate. But on the other hand, you try to look at four or five traits. And what I'm looking at now is the human brain size. So I don't exactly. think that necessarily has to support an evolutionary view, right? I mean, in your book, you do talk a little bit about, you know, how bipedal hominids don't necessarily mean evolution is true. But uh, from your position then, kind of, uh, so would you argue that chimpanzees are like related to the Australopithecines? Well, yeah, that's one argument. Uh, okay. I think is, the problem with Australopithecines is that, again, we have so many fragments. Okay. And they're put together with a bias, which you're trying to show something in between a chimp, in this case, and a human. Sure. Yeah, I'd be very tentative about placing a link between, you know, living apes and Australopithecines about whether or not they're related either. So yeah. do you think there is an alternate explanation for why exactly uh, these Australopithecines have a frame in magnum like this? if they aren't walking bipedally? 
Oh, there's several explanations which people looked at. One is disease. One is it's an abnormality. And there are a number of the problem is, well, not really a problem, but the fact is, is that any animal you look at, you see enormous variety. And a dog's, of course, a good example. You have the dog kind. And as far as we know, they all came from the wolf. And yet, boy, you compare different dogs and you have huge differences. You compare the skeletons and you have huge differences. And you know they're all dogs because you know where this yeah. skeleton came from. And so, therefore, you do find differences in so many animals which don't indicate that one evolved from the other. But we know right. in this case that, of course, yes. all the dogs came, evolved from the wolf. Well, if we're thinking about pathology, that seems to me to be a difficult argument to make, right? Because we have a lot of different Australopithecus skulls um, that all kind of have, you know, this similar range in terms of the position of the frame and magnum. So that seems kind of difficult to label that as pathology, right? If that's that consistent across this population, doesn't that seem kind of problematic? Well, yeah, that would be. And so therefore you would conclude indeed that it's more likely just a variation in the chimp kind, sure. as you see many other variations. So and we do know though that like chimpanzees, for example, they do have this specific range and Australopithecines have this specific range. So if this is a, a functional thing that we would, we would tend to think then that this has some sort of functional significance for locomotion. But do you think that is the case? Yeah, that could well be because, of course, there are a few chimps that do walk upright normally. It's rare, and uh, but indeed there are a few. And so, yeah, this would be, this doesn't prove they're in between, the fact that they walk upright. Well, I mean, th there's a difference there, right? We might say between like habitual and, you know, you know, temporary bipedalism, I suppose, right? right in the case right. of the Australopithecines, if we have this morphology that seems to be indicative of indicative of bipedalism, then that would seem to be that they are specifically adapted to that, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and I understand it's not uncommon to train chimps and others to walk upright for considerable distances. And so they can be trained when you train them when they're young enough to walk up like humans. And of course, many of these chimps were in movies I uh, did mm -hmm. cer played certain parts and would would try to be as human as possible. Of course, that's the, the comedy comes from and the intriguingness comes from their training to look and act somewhat like humans. What intrigues yeah, me true. about the frame and magnum is that we have the example of uh, gibbons that we were talking about before the show, how they have a frame and magnum, which is more centrally placed. And when they come down of the trees, it ends up they walk around on their hind limbs because their arms are so long that basically their their limb bones for their arms aren't strong enough to support their weight uh, being placed on them. And so they end up walking on their hind legs. And then also we have like for orangutans, well, is it orangutans? Um, no, that's that's something else. But anyway, the point is that we have certain uh, certain lesser apes, I suppose that would be then, that, that do have this feature and they end up being bipeds. It seems like this feature is pretty indicative of of bipedalism then and you were bringing up how they can teach uh, creatures to walk to walk upright and I, I read a story about this or sorry it, it was a scientific paper um where they could basically train uh, macaques right to walk upright and what they found is as they trained them to walk upright from a young age they would end up developing a lumbar lordosis right that curve in the lower spine Hmm. which is a developmental feature, right? So when yeah. humans are juveniles, they don't have that curvature in the spine. They just have a, a single slope. But as they learn to walk upright, they develop that. But I thought that was interesting that when a macaque was trained to walk upright, it also would develop that lumbar lordosis. And so it seems that that lumbar lordosis is really an indicator of whether or not a creature has been walking on its hind legs, which to me was interesting because we do know that some of the australopithecines that we have vertebrae from show that that lumbar lordosis. So whether or not that is means that they were bipedal or not is kind of an interesting question. Yeah, that's a good point. That's uh, we. I'm quite interested in dogs, as many people are. It's amazing what they've trained dogs to be able to do. <laughs> Anyways, the brain size. I'm taking average statistics here. Human brain, 1378 grams, and of course the uh, there's many exceptions, but this is average. And the chimp brain, 399 grams. This is from my paleontology book, but 
brain weight comparisons, humans, you can see the human brain is about 2.7 times larger than expected. Gorilla brain, brain, brain is the next largest, but of course gorillas are pretty good size uh, primates. So therefore you'd expect their brain to be larger. Orangutans the same, chimpanzees the same. And of course, as we go down the, the list here, we can see that the brain size becomes smaller and smaller. And again, part of this, of course, is due to the animal size itself. Mm -hmm. you, don't have, you don't have many uh, baboons that are six foot five. Yeah, it's not calculated for body size. So uh, that has to, but anyways, this is what's covered in the paleoanthropology book that we use. The eye difference you can see, human eye at the top and gorilla eye at the bottom. I think that's gorilla. And therefore you can see that we talked about this earlier. You can see the difference is quite dramatic. And the humans, you know, when someone is looking at you, it says something about them because you can see the whites of the eye. Whereas gorillas and most primates, you can't tell what they're looking at, except by where their head is moved toward. And here's another example. These are drawings from uh, a book. And you can see the difference here. The gorilla is made to look human, blue eyes, and you can see the whites of the eyes. And this is not very rare. Another example of a picture from a book on human evolution. And you can see the whites of the eyes are clearly distinct. And it appears to me that this is done to help them look more human. They're evolving. They're on their way to evolving to be humans. Another example here, you can see a gorilla. The whites of the eyes are very clear. And then the next picture here, you can see an African-American. The whites of the eye and the facial features are very similar. And this is taken from a... The, the, Go ahead. the image on the right looks like it's the reconstruction of Homo floresiensis at the uh, Smithsonian Museum. I was there like two weeks ago. That looks almost exactly like it. Oh. I wonder if that could be. It could be. I got this from a, one of my textbooks, but anyway. And there you can see walking upright. We talked about before the uh, walking on four legs. You have long hips, flat iliac blades designed for walking on all fours. It's the most comfortable position. And you can see here, we talked about earlier, the long arms they have. Arms are, what, third as long as the legs, which is a comparison. Human hips are shorter, curved iliac, so that it can have a place for the uh, origin insertion of the gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, and gluteus maximus. And this allows us to walk upright. We need a strong back to walk upright. And they're showing you that picture here, which uh, produces the muscles, the the places where the muscles can attach so that upright can be achieved without problems. For most humans, it's not very comfortable to walk on all fours. And uh, you can see the ape and a human, you can see the walking stance is quite different. So given what we know about like Australopithecines, like Littlefoot, right? We know that they had a longer leg than their arm. And that's interesting, right? Because one of the reasons why it's not comfortable for us to walk on all fours is because our legs are so long, right? So that our rear sticks in the air and our head looks at the ground, right? right. Do you think that Littlefoot's limb proportions would have ended up with, if he had tried walking on all fours, that he would have found that uncomfortable as well because his legs were longer than his arms, just like ours? Yeah, it would, that's true. It would seem to be that would seem to be the case. So uh, that's. So do you think that's an argument to be made for Littlefoot having been bipedal? Some make that argument, but I'm not okay. sure. I need to spend more time looking at Littlefoot. Sure. Right. When was that discovered? That was what? 20? It was like 1996 or something that they 96? discovered it. Maybe it was a little earlier than that. I don't remember exactly, but obviously we didn't get a whole lot of information very fast. <laughs> yeah. We're still waiting on a lot from that. Well, they want to make sure it's studied very carefully so when they publish, they can yep. defend their position. So that's true. So and then good. we got fingers from Lucy's species. Not Lucy, of course, but her species, Australopithecines. And a human finger, you can see the curve versus the straight. And you can see this is the case because, of course, humans don't climb trees and we can grasp things. But monkeys and most primates are very effective in climbing trees, of course. Therefore, the finger design is different. And here's a few more comparisons. And uh, when you see the feet and make comparisons, you can see that human is quite in contrast to all the other feet of primates. And you can see the larger picture here. It's more clear, gorilla, orangutan, and 
baboon and so on. But you can see when you look at other primates as well, you can see the difference is quite apparent. So we have very unique feet. So given what we know about the Australopithecine feet, do you think it is reasonable to argue that they had a, a convergent hallux, a, a big toe that is in line with the rest? Yeah, I mean, that's what argued in some uh, some journals. Yeah, that's. But do you think that's a reasonable argument or or not? Uh, I don't know. I have to look into more detail into that to see whether that's uh, okay. reasonable. Uh, what I know though is the ones they we you can see the comparisons here. There is uh, not much similarity at all, especially the big toe. Sure. Yeah, because in, in my research, I've looked at like the Dakika child, right, the juvenile Australopithecus afarensis which it appears had a slightly more divergent uh, hallux than, you know, modern humans, but it, it's not all the way to the position that you see in it, like chimpanzees. And then we also have obviously like the little foot uh, foot bones as well, right? Originally when uh, Ronald Clark was describing them, he thought that little foot had a divergent big toe, but then later on, they ended up finding more of the bones of the foot and the second metatarsal. And when they fit them together, uh, now it's in publication even that, you know, the foot does not fit together in a way in which the big toe is divergent, as was first thought. Okay. The problem is, is if there are burial animals, you can find with a human foot, very hard to climb up a tree. And very so do you hard think that points to them not being arboreal then? Well, that would yeah, be one indication. And of course, chimps, primates have the advantage where they can climb trees and get away from not all their enemies, but certainly many of them. And it's a mm -hmm. main way they have of protecting themselves. They climb trees and the lion and tiger and cheetah chasing them. That's it. That's the end of the chase. Right. That's so it's lot. interesting there that we have something right where it appears that like Littlefoot and other Australopithecines had a big toe, which was divergent a little bit. So do you think there's some evidence then that they have kind of a little bit of grasping ability, so somewhat of an ability to climb, but not to the extent seen in chimpanzees, which would indicate that they aren't living in the trees as much. Do you think that's... Legitimate? Oh, that's possible. Yeah, that's possible. But again, or the main way they protect themselves is climbing trees. And, uh, right. So we'd have to have a, a bit of a change in behavior, you're saying, right? So Australopithecines, if they were bipedal, would have to be avoiding predators in a different way than, than modern apes do. Right. I just wonder how they can avoid them. Sure. Well, maybe that's why they're extinct. <laughs> well, that be, that's a good point. Uh, and the last one, you have to add some humor in here. This is a paper which was done, which concluded that Lucy died falling out of a tree. 3.1 million years ago, and the uh, anatomist analyzed the bones and concluded that the bone pattern of, of uh, breakage would be similar to what would be produced from falling out of a tree. And uh, I'm not sure how seriously this is taken, but on the other hand, this is an interesting hypothesis. In fact, I think there was a uh, surgeon who uh, looked at the bone structure. Now, this, of course, would indicate that all the bones were found in a very small area. Uh, which is what we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not sure what you think of this, but when well, I'm obviously there's a bit of disagreement. So I, I don't really know that there's a a way to take a very definitive stance on this, right? Because Donald Johansson has come out against this hypothesis, right? So I, I really don't know that we could really know, especially out of a tree, right? I mean, we could, she could have fallen off a cliff for all we know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think most. You know, anthropologists have come out against this theory. Yeah. But I think it's intriguing, and some people have felt, yeah, it looks like the bone they found is a result of a fall. Certainly and possible, I think, yeah. It's possible. So I just find that intriguing that it, was, it is taken seriously by some by some researchers. So Sure, yeah. Anyways, that's the end of my PowerPoint. Yeah, I had a couple of things I wanted to share with you, maybe get your thoughts on here. Let me sure. pull up uh, some uh, slides I had. Um, let's see. There we go. Um, this is what I was talking about, about, um, uh, the Dakika child. Uh, this is from that De Silva paper that was originally describing this foot. And I, I found this really interesting because, 
uh, you can see there, they're looking at the angle of the, uh, the facet of the metatarsal, right, where it would join to the medial uh, cuneiform bone, right, which would uh -huh. kind of determine the angling at which it stuck off. And what I found interesting here is that this, this uh, Dakika child, uh, based on this facet curvature, is falling kind of intermediate here between gorillas and homo in terms of uh, th that, th that curvature, which to me indicates that it doesn't have quite as much of a divergent big toe as, as gorillas. Do you, do you think that's the correct conclusion? Oh, that's wrong. Yeah, that appears to be the case. Yeah. Um, and then I also, uh, this was what I was talking about, how there was that early uh, claim by uh, Clark about the uh, divergence of the hallux, and, and they said it was, it was appreciably diverged. And then uh, more recently, they've, a number of studies have come out against this where they found more of the cuneiform bones and then the base of the second metatarsal. And interestingly, they, they even came to the conclusion here that um, in some, the hypothesis that STW573 had a divergent hallux has been refuted. And, and then this one, uh, they com compared once again, the facet of the, well, this is different, the, the facet of the medial cuneiform. And uh, they said, <laughs> that it lacks the ability to abduct and grasp like apes. So thinking about that, you know, that seems to definitely be pointing to towards Australopithecines not having a, a divergent big toe. Okay. Do you have thoughts on that? That's what makes paleoanthropology so interesting because it's not all straight lined one way. We, the more information we have, the more intriguing it becomes because indeed we find some Cases here like this, that seems to be not divergent toe as we expect to find in most apes, as most mm -hmm. apes. Yeah. That's true. It's a good point. So what do you think this means then? So we have the Australopithecines, right? We can tell, I think, that they are distinct from the genus Homo, but in some ways it does seem like they do kind of trend towards us in, in some ways, right? Including in the divergence of their big toe. So what do you think? The implications there are why exactly kind of how exactly do we as you know young earth creationists understand this is this a successful prediction by evolutionary scientists or how do you kind of approach well that? to me it illustrates the enormous variety we see in the natural world mm -hmm. and i would expect to see enormous variety in the primate world as well which we do but yeah. there's more variety than indeed we first believed and you would expect this because not all primates have survived. They're, they last 6,000 years or so. So uh, a number have become extinct. A number of many kinds of animals have become extinct. And we would accept, expect the same would be true, of course, among primates as well, among especially primates that have hominid or human traits. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a good point. Typically, I would kind of point out that, you know, yes, we have these Australopithecines, but really the Australopithecines are too different from the earliest members of the genus Homo to have been directly ancestral to them as is typically kind of claimed in, uh, in the secular literature. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. I, I think um, we have good evidence to say that. Most presentations I give, like my PowerPoint, are to lay audiences. And one complaint I get is that I, don't, I can't follow because this is too cerebral. And uh, so you kind of tone it down, dumb it down, as they say in college, but not too much. So you want to get some of the ideas and get them to think about what's going on. Hopefully, then they'll do more reading and then they will look beyond what you show in the PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. so when you go to a lot of churches, of course, you have to be pretty careful that you don't put your audience to sleep. Yeah. You know? So we were talking earlier kind of about the pelvic structure of the Australopithecines as compared to um, you know, other apes and then homo sapiens as well. Um, and you were kind of talking about, you know, how chimpanzees have this elongated uh, ilium, right? Which allows right. them to uh, be quadrupedal. So generally, you know, Lucy's pelvis has been typically interpreted as belonging to that of a biped. Can you kind of tell us about why exactly you would argue that, you know, it instead belongs to a quadruped? Well, she could be uh, the Australopithecine. Some, I assume, could indeed be bipedal. Okay. All right. Okay. So I'm not so, saying they all are. Okay. All right. 
but even the pictures here, you see, you see there are differences. Yeah, and certainly. The problem is certainly differences. Yeah. When I taught statistics, you have to look at a sample size and we don't have good sample size for hardly any of the uh, so-called missing links between us and, and apes. So uh, you need a large sample size really to make a lot of definitive conclusion. Now we have that, of course, more and more for Neanderthals. And we mm -hmm. have that more and more, I think, for Australopithecus. Yeah. And so therefore, as we get a larger sample size, we're better able to determine indeed what the typical Australopithecus was like back in whenever they lived. So do you think that, uh, so you said you think that some Australopithecines were bipedal, some were quadrupedal? Possible, you, some were bipedal, okay. bipedal, yeah. Do you have like a specific like species that you think was bipedal? So do you think that Afarensis was bipedal or uh, others weren't? Or do you, do you know, do you kind of have a, or on like a specimen basis, do you know well, exactly I, which ones you would say are bipedal? For instance, which are? Is most commonly believed to be bipedal, at least for me in the mm -hmm. literature. Do. So uh, I would say, yeah, it could be, uh, for instance, could be bipedal, sure. Okay. And what do you think about like uh, Africanus? Uh, probably less likely. Okay. Why exactly I, is that? Again, we, we need, I think, to make any definitive conclusions, we need a large sample size. Sure. Do you do you kind of follow placing uh, Littlefoot in with Africanics in the kind of a sensu lato sense, or do you kind of go with Australopithecus Prometheus for that? Um, not sure. I need to look into more detail into Littlefoot. There's okay. several fossils I need to look into in more detail. I don't think, do we cover Littlefoot in my, my book? Uh, we did Peter, no. Peter Lyne would have if it was covered. Oh by yes, you did. Sorry, I was I was thinking your presentation. Yeah, you did cover Littlefoot in your book. Um, okay. uh, Peter Lyne wrote that chapter. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he he kind of came to some interesting conclusions about um, the the foot bones of, of Littlefoot. He basically came to the conclusion that since there had been you know some scientists who had gone the direction of saying Littlefoot's foot had did not have a or sorry, did have a divergent helix, and others had gone in the direction of saying it did not. That basically we couldn't uh, we couldn't decide, right? The evidence wasn't really discriminatory. Okay. But uh, I don't know. I I found that to be a little bit problematic because uh, the the later scientists who argued that the the toe was not uh, you know divergent were uh, using more evidence, right? By that time, they'd found more foot bones, so. You know, I don't, I don't know exactly how to weigh that, but. Well, when, uh, when we do a revision of the book, and of course in this area, we will need revisions in the future. And you, one cannot say we've got the definitive answer at this point. So hopefully we'll do a revision. And then I can stress that Peter should uh, stress, he should look into the more later finds and then try to, he might change his mind. Yeah, I think that's really the important thing here, right? When we're dealing with evidence like this, it's rather fragmentary. It's hard to really, you know, characterize it. We have small sample sizes, as you said. It's important to kind of draw the distinction between our interpretations and the actual evidence and to make sure that we aren't just imposing what we want to, to think, right, on the fossils. And it's important, right, to, uh, to have humility, I think, because I'm certain that I'm wrong on something I've said about the Australopithecines before. And it's kind of inevitable, right, at this stage, as we're still kind of learning about about them. My concern is not many creationists really know much at all about this area, period. You know more than most creationists that I've met. And so you're among the top 5% knowledge relative to creation. So you can, you can meet me at the, at the wall. <laughs> well, many people, they can't. They have, have a clue as to what I'm talking about. And these are many creationists who are involved in the movement, but their focus is on other things. And this is something I try to point out that many creationists focus way too much on things like the flood or the age question. And those are fine. And I'm, you know, not, but that's not my interest. My interest is more so in other areas, but one area is not my main interest, but one area is human evolution. And sure. I wish there were more creationists that were interested in this area. And that would, help me fine tune my conclusions because it's just hard to come across creations that, you know, you talk about the flood and the age question, but uh, so many other areas like this, they can't really, unfortunately, we need more people involved in paleontology who can deal with this issue. Yeah.
That's so my goal. I hope to eventually go into paleoanthropology. You what? That's, that's my eventual goal is to go into paleoanthropology. And that's great. So, so that we'll see. But uh, yeah, we have uh, a couple people. Peter Line is one working on it. Uh, let's see who else. I think Marcus Ross has done some stuff on it. Doctor yeah. Wood, Doctor Wise have both done some stuff. But certainly, there's a lot more to be worked on here. And forming a general model is also kind of necessary as well so that's true that's a good point that's yeah. why we need people like you <laughs> so as we kind of uh wrap things up here did you kind of want to give us some con kind of concluding kind of uh reasoning about why you think the australopithecine shouldn't be regarded as ancestral to humans well i suppose because judging by the bones is one thing the best way to determine indeed that there's a difference is to meet one. Of course, that's not going to happen, but it'd be nice if there was one around, we could meet and do some tests and cognitive tests and make some comparisons. But uh, I think as we know more about the brain, though, we can look at the brain differences, especially as we have more and more uh, skulls, we can then make comparisons between the skulls. And then we can determine partially, at least to some degree, the brain differences. And of course, we know when we look at the skulls, we know there are brain differences. And so parts of the brain are more developed, like the occipital area, occipital area in humans is quite well developed. And there's not many apes that have an occipital area that's as developed, as far as I know, as we are. And so therefore, that's an important area to, to look into. So, uh, but then again, of course, we are still learning a great deal about the brain and the human brain and its functions. And that's made progress but we still have a lot we don't we don't know all right I well uh, yes uh thank you for coming on uh that was great uh to have a chat with you and thank you to all the viewers uh you can stay on the stream and uh i'll end uh, the broadcast now thank you everyone for tuning in and, and thank you once again uh, dr bergman for joining me okay thank you great to be on it's great to be